Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Future Directions for Cancer Immunotherapy, presented by STAT and sponsored by BD Biosciences. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Should you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to let us know using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to contact the webinar organizers, labeled as STAT events. We will do our best to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. There, you'll also be able to see the questions that other participants have asked and upvote the questions you'd most like to have answered. You may send in your questions at any time and we will address them throughout the presentation. Our webinar sponsor, BD Biosciences, has provided a relevant handout for today's webinar. This handout is available for you to download via the link shared just now by STAT Events in the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email from STAT within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. I would now like to introduce Dr. Karen K. Ursland, Scientific Liaison for Research Solutions for the U.S. Region at BD Biosciences for a sponsored introduction of today's webinar. Thank you, Evan. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. Um, we at BD Biosciences are very excited to be sponsoring this event on the future of cancer immunotherapy because we are a company very passionate about immunology and we have dedicated ourselves to developing the best scientific and discovery tools for immuno-oncology. But let me take a step back and give you our perspective of how using our knowledge of the immune system can contribute to future cancer therapies. So cancer treatments have come a long way, you know, from broad and often toxic therapies to drugs that target specific cellular pathways. So developing cancer treatments still remain challenging, especially ones that are non-specific, right? Because in cancer, it is really our own selves that have turned against us. And a general cancer treatment cannot distinguish our good self and our bad self. But one system in our body is absolutely great at this, and this is our immune system. It has the ability to home in on very specific targets, just like it routinely screens the body for invading pathogens, like bacteria and viruses, as well as the ability to recognize and destroy our own cells that have gone wrong. So cancer cells know this, and they develop very specific mechanisms to avoid the immune system. Now, the path to discovering novel therapeutic targets for immunotherapy requires very deep understanding of the cellular um, interactions. This is because the immune system is a very complicated network. It comprises of many cell types that keeps each other in check and so that there's enough inflammation to destroy the bad cells, but not so much information to destroy our healthy cells. So we have to uncover how the immune system interacts with the cancer cells. So for example, if we take a look at a tumor microenvironment on a single cell level, we can understand which cells are important and which roles they play. How do they interact with cancer cells? How does the, micro, uh, the tumor microenvironment changes the immune cells? Are the cells more activated? Are the cells dampened in response? We can derive a lot of information when we dig down into a biological system that way. So we at BD Biosciences have been doing single cell analysis of the immune system by flow cytometry since the 1970s. And we're able to characterize a variety and many, many varieties of cell types and functions by looking at the proteins expressed on individual cells. And we can do this by analyzing cells at thousands and thousands of cells a second. And not only that, after just analyzing those cells, we also have the ability to pick out the cell types of interest and sort them out to perform further experiments. So, and as the field evolved, because you know I said the 1970s, our understanding of other aspects for cancer therapies are they're also important. So as our understanding of genomics and intracellular regulations evolve, it is also clear that we must combine the protein information, so the proteomic information, as well as the mRNA and gene expression level information of that single cell. So combining those two pieces of information will provide deeper insight into really critical cellular mechanisms that can provide great candidates for good therapeutic targets. So when you do analysis and discovery on this level, 
what you get back is data that comprises of hundreds of biological markers on the single cell, in addition to analyzing millions of cells. So with this pace of technology, we also must involve our computational methods to, com to accommodate the complexity of this data and to dive deep into which biological mechanisms are important. So we at BD Biosciences are absolutely committed to this total solutions to help you uncover high dimensional biological data. We have solutions for our sample collection to single cell analysis of the proteome, Nomics and mRNA information, and also comprehensive bioinformatic tools to help you do your discovery. So we are here to partner with you on this scientific and discovery journey. So thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Um, please take a moment and answer the following poll question. and I'll give that a minute or so. And if you have any additional questions in terms of our discovery and research approaches, please feel free to um, put in a question in the Q&A and somebody from our team will respond to you. Thank you so much. Um, Evan? Thank you, Karen. For the remaining portion of this presentation, I would like to introduce Adam Feuerstein, Senior Writer for Biotech at STAT. Take it away, Adam. Hey, Evan. Thanks so much. Uh, if you can uh, activate my clicker and we can, we can get started. Great. All right, let's see you get this thing working. So Evan, I'm not able to, uh, the my, oh, there we go. I'm sorry, it's working. That's good. All right, here we go. So uh, again, my, my name is Adam Feuerstein. I'm a senior reporter at STAT and I really appreciate everybody joining us today for this webinar. Um, as you saw, the, the, the title of this webinar is Future Directions for Cancer Immunotherapy. Will new targets, new technologies deliver benefit to more patients uh, as, you know, obviously that's a, it's a very broad topic. Uh, and, you know, we probably could spend, you know, we could probably run an entire like college level course for two semesters talking about the various different uh, modes of immunotherapy that are going. So, so I had to really kind of narrow down what I wanted to, to focus on today with this webinar. So I tried to choose a few different things that I think are kind of really interesting. They're sort of all forward looking. So I, you know, these are all sort of question marks because we don't, we don't know whether these, you know, whether these technologies are ultimately going to work yet. Um, but they're in the early stages of, you know, we have some data that look really intriguing and some promising. And I think these are the kind of things that as we look forward, that a lot of people are focused on. I, I know that as I, as I cover meetings like ASCO and ESMO and ASH every year, I'm seeing more and more of these kinds of topics uh, show up. And so that's what I wanted to focus on today. So here, well, so, so the agenda here is simple, pretty much we're gonna talk about TIGIT, which is uh, a new checkpoint inhibitor. I think we're all probably familiar with the PD, PD1, PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors. TIGIT is a new target that's getting a lot of buzz these days, particularly uh, in, in some of the larger pharma companies. Then I wanted to talk about uh, NK cells. Uh, and again, this is a type of uh, an emerging type of cell therapy, off the shelf cell therapy that I think is getting a lot of attention. Uh, we've seen some really, like over the last couple of ASH meetings in, this, you know, in, the, in last December, the December before that, we've seen some really interesting early data from NK cells. And so I wanted to talk about that. And lastly, um, mRNA is probably something that we are all very, very familiar with these days given the fact that it is, you know, the basis for two of the vaccines, the COVID vaccines that have been rolled out here in the United States and elsewhere. Um, but obviously mRNA can also has applications as a therapeutic, not just as a vaccine. And so some of the companies that are developing, uh, that are, you know, that are sort of pioneering mRNA are trying to develop uh, mRNA based uh, cancer therapeutics. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those things as well. All right. So let's get to, uh, let me just say again, um, and just to back up what Evan said, I, I really, I'd love to get questions from you guys. So um, feel free to throw uh, questions into the Q&A thing. I will be, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the Q&A questions now. So I'll, I'll see them as I talk and if anything is kind of relevant, so you don't even have to wait to the end 
just um, ask questions, type them in there, and uh, and I'll try to weave some of the questions and answer some of the questions as as we kind of go through as we go through this webinar. All right, so let's um, let's talk about Tidget. As I said, uh, you know, Ken, the question here is, will this kind of be the next blockbuster checkpoint inhibitor? I thought I could not do a webinar without uh, starting with a meme. So uh, I think you guys have all seen the distracted uh, boyfriend meme and it just seemed appropriate here and, and almost as a sort of cautionary tale because uh, we have gone down this road before. We have, we have seen some other targets get a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz, generate a lot of clinical data and then sort of kind of fall out of favor. Um, you know, probably IDO being, I would probably say the most famous or infamous of those targets. You know, this is the, you know, uh, insights drug with uh, Epic Epic Epicatostat, you know, had a lot of promising data, early data, single arm phase two data that looked like it was going to be uh, great when it when when looked in, in combination with with uh, checkpoint inhibitors with like, you know, something like uh, Pembrolizumab from Merck. Um, but as we know, back in 2008, eight, I'm sorry, 2018, the, the, a very large phase three study looking at that combination therapy, you know, failed. And so, you know, this is just kind of a, a you know, maybe a little bit of, again, a caution that, you know, a lot of the, the TIGID data that we've seen is a little early and, and we don't ultimately know what will happen. But uh, like, like I said, right now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in this target. All right, so I just wanted to start here just by kind of going back and I'm gonna, this will be fine. I, I have a single slide where I'm gonna like try to explain like the entire current state of immunotherapy as we know it today. And um, we'll see if I can do it justice. But as, as most of you probably know, you know, the current state of checkpoint inhibitors, you know, these are drugs that target, you know, there's three proteins right now that are targeted, PD-1, PDL1, CTLA4, and those, and, and when you target those, when you block those proteins, those connections between T cells and cancer cells, you're essentially releasing the break on T cells. And these have been, you know, transformative therapies for cancer patients. And, I, and I'm sure you guys know, you know, you've, the leading PD1 inhibitors, you know, Merck's uh, Keytruda or Pembrolizumab, Bristol's Abdevo, Nivolumab, um, you know, those are two, you know, you've got on the PDL1 side, Probably the biggest one is Roche's to centric, uh, and then the CTLA4 that's approved is that's from Bristol. It's Yervoy. You know these are these are blockbuster uh, commercial products. Some of the most successful commercial products, and really, like I said, you know, showing transformative survival benefit across multiple different types of cancer. You know, while at the same time, you know, we have to concede that a majority of cancer patients, you know, do not benefit from these current checkpoint inhibitors. And so the goal here is what we're trying to do, what, what researchers, what companies and scientists are trying to do is reach more patients. How do we, how do we get more patients to benefit from immunotherapy? And so one of the ways that's, that's being looked at is reaching more patients with, you know, with combination treatments. And, you know, it's, what's kind of interesting is like when you thought about it, like if you think about the early days of immunotherapy, we thought that maybe, you know, the sort of the old school kinds of cancer treatments like chemotherapies or radiation would sort of go by the wayside that we wouldn't we need those anymore. But what we found, you know, what, what, what researchers have found today is that, you know, some of the more effective combination treatments are actually when you take a checkpoint inhibitor and you combine it with chemotherapy, or you can combine it with radiation. Um, if you think about something like Merck's Keytruda plus chemotherapy, which is, you know, kind of the standard of care for newly diagnosed uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer today, um, that's, you know, kind of, that's kind of the, the, probably the most successful way that we've, we've, we've kind of looked into, we've kind of moved forward into combination treatments. Um, on the other hand, trying to combine and different immunotherapies together has kind of struggled to achieve success. Like I said, the, you know, the, the IDO uh, checkpoint, the IDO uh, PD-1 combination didn't work. Now we do have combination therapies, uh, you know, the, the PD-1 uh, CTLA-4, you know, from Bristol. So, you know, combination of Abdevo and Yervoy is an approved treatment, although there also does added toxicity there. So I guess it, it, it you know, I think what, what, what people ultimately are looking for and, and a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of focus is spent on trying to find new combinations of immunotherapies that will be more effective for patients and bring more patients into the, into the world of immunotherapy. So there'd be more patients who can benefit than just on what we, what we see today. 
this is just a slide. I want, I don't spend a lot of time here, but this is just gives you give you a sense of like I said when I when I mentioned that you know the existing PD one PDL one sales. Uh, you know these are blockbuster drugs. You can look over this slide. This is from J P Morgan. Uh, this was something that they put together late last year. So the numbers might have changed, and I'm not really that interested in the exact numbers. But obviously, directionally, you can see here just how big, and, and those are numbers that are in billions. So you can see just how big uh, a market this is, and and show and kind of just also shows you the potential for you know if we have new, more effective checkpoint inhibitors. All right, so let's talk about TIGIT. So what is TIGIT? Well, first of all, that's an acronym. So TIGIT stands for T-cell immunoreceptor with immunoglobulin and ITM domains. So thank God we have, uh, we have an acronym for that because that's a lot easier to say. So TIGIT was actually uh, discovered back in the early 2000s by some scientists at Roshan Genentech. Um, and it's, what TIGIT is, it's highly expressed on certain types of immune cells. Um, so what it does is, and if you think about like, like, like we said with a check with the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, what we know about those are those, those release the breaks. What TIGIT does is, the, what, the, what that TIGIT does you know, in its native state, it suppresses the immune activation of T cells and natural killer NK cells. So that's another type of immune cell, right? And, and at the same time, it enhances, it enhances the immune suppression of regulatory T cells or what's known as Tregs. So again, this is how cancer evades the immune system. Um, blocking TIGIT not only releases the break on the immune system, which is like what PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors do, but it also presses on the gas. So it actually not only just, you know, it releases the break and allows the immune system to, to activate and to attack tumors, but it also starts to stimulate these T cells and natural killer cells. So that's where TIGIT is a little bit different from the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And where, where it's being pursued now, there, there, there's not a lot of data to suggest that monotherapy or just a TIGIT inhibitor on its own has activity against tumor cells. But what we've seen so far is that combination therapy, so to taking a, taking an, a, a TIGIT inhibitor a TIGIT inhibitor, inhibitor, I'm sorry, and combining it with a PD-1 or PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor, that's where we're seeing some really intriguing data so far. And that's kind of what's driving a lot of the excitement. This is, um, I, I, I didn't take a lot of biology in college, but um, this is my stab at um, a biology lecture. Um, so if anyone, if I screw this up and just Someone in the comments or in the Q and A tell me, and I can and I'll, and I'll correct myself. But in this diagram, what we have here is, you know, we've got here on the upper left, we've got a big blue green T cell. On the bottom, you have a tumor cell. And I just wanted to just show you this is a slide that Bristol Myers has in, in in one of their slide decks, and you know, you can see this kind of graphical representation of how a, a how a TIGIT drug would work. Um, a lot of companies have different kinds. You can see different variations of this. But what they all show is here is the, is the connections and how these drugs might work. And so what you see is you see the TIGIT, you see the TIGIT protein on the t, on the surface of the T cell. And what it does is when it interacts with it, when the drug comes in and interacts and basically blocks two different connections there, the CD155 and the CD112 by blocking those connections. That's what activates the T cells, that's what sort of releases the break on the T cells um, and the NK cells. And then the activation part, the sort of pressing on the gas part of this is done here with that, with those proteins called CD2, I'm sorry, CD226. That's where that, that's where that sort of part, and that's kind of where, again, why people are kind of excited about Tigit is that it has a sort of added feature to it. All right, so a lot of the excitement that we've talked about with Tigit so far has been generated by Roche. Like I said, they they were the ones in the early 2000s that sort of discovered this new target, and they are the they are the pharma company that is most far along in developing a drug to target Tigit. Um, and that drug is called Teragolat, Teragolamab. I'm gonna butcher all of these names, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, and so this is uh, this is Tigit in action. These are data. Um, that were presented last spring at the ASCO meeting. Um, and this is from a randomized phase two study. It's called Cityscape. 
Um, we can thank Genentech, Arosh, because they do randomized controlled studies in phase two, unlike a lot of companies. And, and so you can get some pretty interesting data when you do randomized controlled early stage or mid stage randomized controlled studies. And this is a study that was done in patients that had, uh, that were newly diagnosed or first line non small cell lung cancer. Uh, and if you look at these data on this slide, what you see here is, so again, the, I'm sorry, just to go back. So, so the, basically patients who entered the study were randomized to either receive tiragolumab plus tocentric, which is Roche's um, PDL one inhibitor or tocentric alone, okay? Uh, and what you see here is on the ITT side, if you look at the far left, um, what you see here, this is response rate data. You see that the combination, the response rate was 37% versus 21% in the control arm, which was decentric alone. Uh, you know, a, a, a numerical difference in favor of the combination, but maybe not so, not as, as big a difference as one had hoped to see. But when you look in, if you look at the middle uh, group here, these are patients who entered the study who had um, who had high levels of PD PDL1, right? So these are the patients who, with that PDL1 biomarker, who have who are sort of quote unquote sort of super expressors of PDL1, um, more apt to respond, have more immunologically active tumors. Um, what you see here is a much larger difference in the response rate, 66% in the combination arm versus 24% uh, in, the, in the monotherapy arm. And this is where you've got a lot of, this is kind of what generated a lot of excitement going forward. Uh, and this is where Roche is taking it forward. Of course, uh, when you subgroup um, a study, when you look at one group of patients, uh, the other group of patients don't do as well. So if you look at patients in the far right, those are patients who have lower levels of PDL1 entering the study. Um, and there you see that there was really no difference at all in the response rates. These are also, these are more data from the same study. This is looking at um, progression-free survival. Uh, here on the left, again, if you look at, these are all the patients combined, um, you know, so not, not parsing them out by PDL1. You see here a hazard ratio of 0.58. So that's a 42% reduction in the risk of disease pro progression, favoring the combination arm, a nice separation of the curves there. Again, they're here on the right-hand side. These are the patients who are sort of the skin, the super, the high expressors of PDL1, where where they had hoped to see better activity, um, and indeed they did here. The hazard ratio here, 0 0.30, so that's a 70% reduction in disease progression of you know obviously a much wider separation of those curves. So based on these data, um, this is in, you know, Roche has got a pretty extensive program with teragolumab looking at a, a variety of different cancers. And on this slide, just what I would point you to, you know, so these are, these are studies that are all ongoing. And what I would direct you to is uh, the middle of this slide, uh, the phase three, the skyscraper 01 study in particular, that's a study in non-small cell lung cancer, again, with uh, high PDL one expression. Um, so, you know, based on those, the phase two data, you know, Roche started this phase three study, which is basically looking to confirm the benefit that they saw in that phase two, they said in that phase two study. You know, the patients, uh, that study started enrolling patients last year. So these, these all obviously all studies that are ongoing, but you can see as for a company like Roche, I mean, this is, you know, they obviously are placing a pretty big bet on Tidget. If you can look at, you know, the number of studies and the kinds of cancers that they're, that they're running here. Um, you know, the sort of the takeaways that I would say about, about Tidget, you know, just based on these Roche data, if you think about it is, you know, is that, you know, First of all, I didn't mention anything about safety, but I should say that, you know, from a safety perspective, adding Tigit to a PD-1 or PDL one inhibitor um, was, was, was well tolerated. There were no additional significant toxicities that would you, that, you know, that you would be on the lookout for in a combination. You know, these are meaning, you know, these are meaningful ha hazard ratios. If we just, if we go back, these are, you know, meaningful hazard ratios here. And, you know, again, in this high PDL one patient population, um, you know, the data don't look as convincing or as good when you look at them in all comers. And I think that's one of the issues here is, um, you know, is this going to be, uh, is this going to be a combination therapy that may only 
benefit patients who have this high level of PD-L1 or PD-1 expression and not for all patients. That's something that we'll have to see. Um, but again, Roche is targeting high PD-L1 patients in, in their phase three programs. Um, you know, another potential advantage here is, is that, you know, you're eliminating chemotherapy. So these are patients where you don't have to give chemotherapy uh, and all the toxicities that are involved with chemotherapy. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, this is a randomized study, right? So we, you know, we, we get the best data, the most convincing data from randomized controlled studies. Um, and that's what this is. So I think, you know, the, the, the sort of the level of the level of credibility with these data, I think are, are, are a lot higher. Um, some of the questions that come out of this, I think are, you know, is, uh, you know, is whether or not in this particular study, I think some of the questions that have been raised is, is whether or not the, the tocentric alone arm, so that the patients who only received tocentric, did those patients underperform what you have seen in other previously reported, previously conducted tocentric studies? And that ultimately what that, what, what that question is, is, you know, whether or not, whether if, if these patients for some reason underperformed, if the control arm patients underperformed in this study, did that skew the response rate higher? So maybe we're seeing an artificially high response rate. And ultimately, you know, the only way we will know that is until the, the phase three study uh, reads out. All right. So moving ahead, um, another, you know, sticking with Tidget, but uh, moving ahead, I wanted to talk a little bit here about Arcus Biosciences, because I think from a sort of a biotech perspective, you know, there's been a lot of focus and a lot of attention on Arcus because they have a, they have a Tidget drug that they are developing. Uh, and so, you know, sort of getting out of the sort of big pharma realm and into biotech. Uh, and what's interesting about uh, Arcus is probably the most, you know, from an investor standpoint, or, you know, they have a, they have a partnership with Gilead Sciences, which they, uh, which they uh, entered into last spring, uh, last May. Uh, and Gilead has an option uh, to co-develop and co-market the Tidget drug that, that Arcus has. It's called, and it's that drug called Damvan, Damvan Nalimab. Um, that's their, that's the, tig the Tidget drug that Arcus has. Gilead has an option to co-develop and co-market that drug. Gilead paid, I think, something like 170, 175 million dollars up front. They also made an equity investment, uh, an equity investment in in Arcus. So uh, we are waiting. So this, what I've got here on this slide is another randomized uh, phase two study that uh, Arcus is conducting. It's, it's ongoing right now. Uh, and the reason that there's uh, interest here is because these data are expected relatively soon. We may get uh, data from this study, uh, you know, kind of before the middle of the year. I think the company is guided to uh, having data from this study in the first half of 2021. So, you know, probably sometime in the second quarter. Um, and if you look at this design, again, what you see here is, again, first line, uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. Again, these are patients who have pd one expression of greater than or equal to 50%. So these are sort of the high pd one expressing patients. So, so similar to the same target population that Roche is is targeting with its tinted drug. And here you have three, you have three arms randomized. Um, first arm is, again, is a uh, Zimber, I'm just going to call it Zimber. That is Arcus's own uh, proprietary. That is their PD-1 inhibitor that they have uh, under development. So those patients there, I've, as you see, they will get monotherapy Zimber. Um, arm two, that's the arm that I think a lot of people are focused on, obviously, is a combination. So you get the PD-1 inhibitor plus Arcus's Tidget. And then the third arm is a triplet. There's another immune, immune sort of a, another immune targeted drug that Arcus is developing. So you've got a triple combination therapy in the third arm. And as you can see there, you know, the, the co-primary the co endpoints here are progression-free survival and, and response rate. So again, this is a study that's ongoing. We should see data from this soon. So it's, you know, obviously very important to Arcus, um, potentially very important to Gilead because Gilead has an option to, uh, to kind of to option into this program. I, and, you know, just for the, you know, just again, for the sort of the Tidget world, in, you know, overall world, uh, you know, again, another randomized controlled study of this target, and so I think, you know, if these data look good, um, you know, it would be validating, you know, obviously it would be validating for the target. It will be very interesting to see whether or not uh, the Arcus drug, you know, again, does maybe does better or worse than the Roche drug, of course, you know, with all the caveats of cross trial comparisons, 
but I mean, that's what, that's, that's what we are, that's what people are waiting for. One thing I should mention here, um, and this is going to, this gets a little bit deep in the weeds, but there is there, you know, obviously there are going to be differences between different, different Tiget drugs. Um, there is one pretty primary and, and I would say, I would, I don't know if a controversial is the word, but I would say one sort of the most significant difference between the Roche Tiget drug and the Argus Tiget drug is that is that the Argus drug just lacks um, what's known as F, uh, FC effector function activity. They, it's a different structure. It, it has no FC effector. So what basically, not to get too complicated because I, I'm not going to kind of go deep into the weeds here, but essentially, it you know, it, it, it's a way, it's, it's another way that antibodies attract and activate the immune system. Um, there's some controversy over whether or not that really matters in cancer and, and will matter with Tiget drugs. Um, Roche seems to believe Roche's drug has this FC effector function uh, built into their Tiget drug. They tend, they seem to believe that it does, and that that's one of the keys to that drug's efficacy is this FC effector function. Arcus. Is Argus' drug does not have it. So that's one of the questions I think that will come up when we see the Arcus data uh, and we compare it to the Roche data. We'll be able to, they'll, they'll, there will be a lot of discussion about whether this sort of this FC region, this FC effector function matters or not. All right. So other tissue drugs in clinical development. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of folk, a lot of attention here. Um, these are some of the other companies. I apologize if I've left some out, but these are the companies that I know of that are, you know, that are actively developing um, drugs in clinical development. I will just mention here Merck being, uh, you know, just mentioned the Merck one in particular here. Um, what's interesting about Merck is that they did actually show in a small study uh, and a single arm study. So there was no control data here, but they did show some small numbers of monotherapy uh, responses in a lung cancer study, um, which again, it was kind of unusual. We haven't seen that. Um, those studies, those responses were unconfirmed. So there's some question about, you know, sort of whether those can be confirmed or not, but there was some, but in, they, they are also looking at their, their TIG drug in combination, obviously with pembrolizumab, with Keytruda. Um, and in some early data that was as presented, uh, was presented last year, um, they had a 24% response rate uh, in a combination of with their drug, MK7684 and, and Keytruda. There was, again, that study had, did not have a control arm. So it was not a randomized controlled study. Um, but again, just more evidence of you know, potential activity for, uh, for combination therapy. So let me look here to see if there's any good questions on this stuff. Um, so Joel asks, is there evidence that using Tigit in combination will make immunotherapy effective in cancers where it is currently not effective? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that most of the cancers that are being looked at, and somebody can chime in in the q and I think most of the, most of the cancers that are being looked at with the combination are in cancers where you already see activity in a PD-1 or PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitor, right? So the idea here is really to, is to is sort of, is to make those make a combination therapy that's more effective and have and have more patients respond to it. Just going through some of the Q and A here. All right, so let's move on. And this is, and I'll just, I'll just finish here. I should have, I should have, I could have finished here. These are just some of the questions out there. You know, again, um, just to sum up the, this, this, this part of the webinar, you know, again, are two checkpoints better than one, you know, or, or, or will they be better than checkpoint plus chemo? I think that that's kind of one of the questions that are unanswered and, and, and we'll find out with more data. Um, you know, will TIGIT combinations work in low expressing patients? Like, like, as we said, right now, the data have been sort of suboptimal, sort of mediocre when it looks at, uh, patients who have low levels of PDL1 or PD1. Um, and so that's an that's a question that's an open question that's out there is whether these combinations will ultimately be expanded to more of an all comer patient audience. Um, you know, can biomarkers help guide treatment? I mean, right now, um, it, it appears that measuring TIGIT or using TIGIT as a expression of TIGIT as a biomarker doesn't seem to correlate with response. But again, that's more, that's more to be to be determined. Um, uh, 
will TIG combinations work in patients where PD-1, PD-L1s are no longer effective? That was one of the questions that was asked. I don't, like I said, I think that is an, an, an unanswered question right now. Most of the work, like I said, if you look at it's most of the work right now is in lung. We know that we know that checkpoint PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors are effective in lung. It's just they're the, pretty much the standard of care in lung. And that's where a lot of this, this work is, is looking now in these combinations with TIGIT is in lung. And how long before these questions can be answered? Um, like I said, you know, I really look for that Arcus data to be coming in the second quarter. I mean, I think that'll be a pretty pivotal event for biotech and for this field. And then ultimately, you know, you know, for you know, the more definitive answer, I think we will wait for you know Roche's phase three studies to to read out where we'll get you know much more definitive, conclusive evidence about the role of TIGIT might play in immunotherapy. All right, moving on, NK cells. I'm looking at the clock and of course I'm running way over. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna breeze through these but I'll try, to, I'll try to move a little faster. All right, so NK cells, what are they? They are a type of immune cell of the innate immune, immune system. And yeah, get basically the first line of defense, right? The first line of defense against non-self viruses and cancer cells in the body. Um, they're natural, which means that they don't require activation by an antigen target, unlike T cells, and they have the ability to kill cancer cells directly and indirectly. So if we think about NK cell therapy, what's interesting is if we, if we think about it, we sort of step back a second and think about cell therapy and cancer in general. I think most of you, most people are obviously very familiar with CAR T therapies out there. And what are, what are CAR T therapies? What are the, how do the current CAR T therapies work? We take T cells out of a patient, we bring them to a lab, and we engineer them, we, we, add, we, add, uh, we add a protein to them, we add receptors to them that recognize uh, proteins that are on the surface of cancer cells. And then we, we also engineer them to, to be activated once and multiply once they're inside of patients. We take those, we put them back into the patient, and then those, those cells then go after and try to find and seek out those cancer cells and kill them. Um, these are personalized therapies, right? So each patient has a CAR-T therapy made for them. Um, while, you know, and that's one of the limiting factors, right? Is that, you know, while production of CAR-T CAR -T therapies have, you know, become more efficient, companies have become more proficient at making them, the whole sort of supply chain and process by which patients get CAR-T therapy have improved greatly since they first were, you know, first in clinical trials and then approved, but it's still a limiting factor in that you have to, you know, every patient has to have their own CAR-T therapy made for them. So, the idea with with you know with newer forms of cell therapy is can we have an allogeneic or off the shelf therapy? Can we have something that could be an on demand treatment that that all patients can take would be much more convenient? And that's one of that's one of the advantages potentially of an NK cell therapy versus a you know a CAR T th CAR T therapy. Although of course as we know there are also you know allogeneic or off the shelf CAR T therapies are also you know T cell therapies are also being developed today. And so NK cells, again, they're allogeneic, they're off the shelf. Um, they can be dosed similarly to antibodies or small, small molecules, which means, you know, they can potentially have repeat dosing, something that like, you know, current CAR T cells are much, it's more difficult to do. Um, again, on-demand treatment. Um, NK, NK cells also have fewer side effects. So they don't cause uh, the cytokine release syndrome and the neurotoxicity that you see with CAR T therapies, uh, current CAR T therapies, which is something that, you know, while they can, while those side effects can be managed with CAR T therapy, you know, it is, it is an issue for patients. So again, so there are probably more similarities between NK cells and allogeneic CAR Ts these days. But again, if you think about NK cells, therapy, the, the simplest way of thinking about it is instead of working with a T cell as kind of the as kind of your starting material for, a, for, a, for a cellular therapy, you're starting with an NK cell. All right, so where do we get NK cells? Um, like I said, these are potentially off the shelf. So uh, there's four main sources of NK cells. You get NK cells from the peripheral blood of healthy donors. So donors go into a facility and have uh, have blood drawn, and from that blood you can you can extract and harvest NK cells again from healthy donors. Um, cord blood from cord banks from the cord blood. Uh, I think everyone knows, sort of knows what cord blood and cord banks are. Um, then there's induced pluripotent stem cells (iPSCs). Um, this is uh, if you think about again a, a pluripotent uh, stem cell is kind of like a 
you know, it's sort of like this, it's kind of a, a cell that a precursor cell that can ultimately be manipulated and grown into any other kind of cell. Um, and what companies have done is taken these stem cells and basically manipulated them in in a basically a you know a supply bank and made and turned them into stem cells. I'm sorry, turned them into NK cells. So this is kind of a source. You can basically have this as an unlimited supply of NK cells from that that start from stem cells that um, that you can use to make into cell therapies. And then you also have um, specific NK cell lines that you can also grow. So, like I said, if you if you think about if you think about NK cells uh, and how they work, or what the potential here is, and what people are excited about them, is that you can take an NK cell which already sort of naturally has anti-tumor properties, and you can basically supercharge them, just like you will, just like we do now with T cells, where we add things to the T cells to make them more potent tumor killers, you can do the same thing with an NK cell. So one of the one of the drawbacks, which I should mention about NK cells is that they don't they don't last long in the body. So but you can add something like an IL-15, you can engineer it to increase the persistence of the NK cell, you can add a car a chimeric antigen receptor, again, like think about like a CD19, which is I think which is the, you know, current CAR T cells, if you think about the ones that are out there that have been out approved for the longest, they, they target, you know, they target this protein CD19 that's found on, on blood tumors, on blood cancer cells. Um, you can do the same thing with an NK cell, you can add a, you can add a CD19 CAR to an NK cell. You can also add other receptors that help bind NK cells to antibody drugs to also increase, increase their efficacy. So these are all the kind of things that are happening right now um, that companies are working on. Oh, having a problem advancing my slide. One sec. Oh, there we go. Whoop. Back one, sorry. So I just wanted to. This is I, I don't want to go over this all that study, and I and I neglected to put the citation for the slide for this study, but you could look it up. Um, a lot last year, this the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was kind of a I would call it like a proof of concept study that NK NK therapies potentially could work against cancer and. The study was done by researchers at MD Anderson. A lot of people sort of point to this as kind of like some of the most exciting data that's come out for NK cell therapies to date. Um, and essentially what they did was they took NK cells that uh, they derived from cord blood. Then this, again, the source here was cord blood for the NK cells. And they basically engineered them to add an anti-CD19 CAR. They added interleukin-15 again to, to increase the persistence. And they... They, they use these patients, to, they use this, this sort of engineered NK cell to treat patients with a couple of different types of blood cancer. Um, and so again, I did, you know, you can, you can read the study yourself, but essentially what they found was, again, they found that essentially that, you know, using this NK cell therapy in patients was not associated with cytokine release syndrome or neurotoxicity. So it was essentially safe. There was no graft versus host disease. So the patients who they introduced this into that they administered this to didn't reject the NK cell therapy. So from a tolerability and safety standpoint, it, it looked clean. And they also showed some pretty pretty amazing responses. So there were eleven patients. Eleven patients were were treated in the study. Eight of those patients, or seventy three percent, had a response. And of those patients, seven um, and four with lymphoma and four with CLL had a complete remission. So again, this was kind of a really good proof of concept study that an NK cell therapy could be effective in these two types of blood cancer. One thing that they weren't able to show in the study is durability. So that's kind of one of the big questions with NK cell therapies is how, how durable will these responses be? As I mentioned, um, NK, NK cells do not last long in the body. So um, they were not able to measure, they didn't follow patients long enough to see what the sort of the duration of response or how durable these responses could be in patients. And obviously that's very important. But one of the, again, one of the potential advantages of an NK cell therapy and, and things that, that companies are, um, exploring is again, is dosing. Can you, can you dose again? Can you give multiple rounds of NK cell therapy to patients, which is something that like, you know, again, when you think about CAR T therapies, it's much more difficult to do.
All right, I wanted to talk about a, a, a couple, a few companies here that are uh, working in uh, the NK cell therapy space. Uh, the first company, and it's probably the company that's kind of got the most attention uh, in this world is Fate Therapeutics. Uh, it's a company that has about an $8 billion market value today. Um, and again, I mentioned before the, you know, the, that starting with, you know, starting with as your source for MK cells, starting with stem cells and kind of creating this bank, you know, this sort of stem cell derived bank of NK cells. That's, that's what Fate does. And so Fate has this, basically this, this, this unlimited supply of stem cell of, of, NK cells that they derive from from these pluripotent stem cells, and that's kind of what that's the source that they use for ultimately to 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 de develop their NK cell therapies. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, all of these, but these are this is a slide again from Fate that shows um, some of the different products that they're developing. Um, and so that, and you can see what you can sort of take away from the slide is that, you know, you basically have a lot of optionality and the way that you engineer these NK cell slides, right? These NK cells, um, and you can add multiple different, you can ultimately, you can add multiple different things. So if you look at something like FT500, which is like their first experimental therapy, that's a naked NK cell. So that's basically the NK cells that they, that they have derived from their, from their supply bank off the shelf given to patients. They haven't done, they're not doing any engineering to that NK cell. And then if you sort of step up to uh, a product like FT516 there, where you see that they're adding, they're adding, uh, they're adding a, a CD16, um, which is again, it, it sort of, it helps it helps that connect with an antibody. Um, so again, so you're you're adding the CD16 protein receptor, um, and that can help bind to like that can add a bind to like a, a tumor killing antibody uh, drug. Let's say like a rituxan, right? And then if you go to something like 5T96, 596, which again a little bit more there, you see it's a little bit more uh, complicated, a little bit more engineering. So what you're basically starting with, you're taking that NK cell, you're enhancing it with that CD16 receptor. So it's in that way, it's sort of the same as 516. But then you're adding that CD19 car, right? So you're adding you're adding that CD19 car to the cell. Um, and again, so that's that's just kind of shows you all the different ways that you can manipulate these NK cells to sort of make them more potent. This again, this is just kind of shows you a, a schematic of what FT9596 uh, looks like here. And here as well is, is another one of their another one of their products, uh, FT5676. So just looking ahead, uh, before I get down, Carter, just look, looking ahead with fate. Um, like I said, so like over the last the last few Ash meetings, um, they've showed some like you know very early responses and and some studies, early studies. Again, I don't want to go through all the data here, um, but again, it's it's shown some potential, and I think that's what's gotten people excited. Um, I know they have some preclinical data that's going to be um, presented at the uh, AACR annual meeting coming up in April, and then I know the company has. Um, promise more data up through, you know, through this year and next year. Um, so again, uh, we'll move on to Encarta. Now, the reason I wanted to look at Encarta was again, is that I I'm trying to, I sort of pick companies that have like different source material for, for their NK cells. So Encarta uses again, whereas uh, Fate has this, you know, stem cell bank that they use to create their NK cells, uh, Encarta gets their uh, harvest NK cells from healthy donors. This is a schematic of, of how that works with how they collect and donate and then, you know, manipulate, expand those, those, NK, those NK cells uh, before they get administered into patients. Um, one thing interesting here with Encarta is um, one of the questions that's come up with NK cells is, is, you know, can you preserve, like, how do you preserve these cells? Um, I think they've shown some early data showing that you can freeze and then defrost the NK cells and still show activity. Um, NKX101 is their uh, is their is their lead product right now. These are uh, all the data that so far has been preclinical. This is their lead program, uh, and it's targeted to a uh, the, the target here is NKG to D. Um, you can see that here on the slide. Um, and I think we are expecting what are we expecting data? Yeah, so we are expecting. Uh, I think you can just get the first clinical data um, from NCARTA um, by the end of the year. 
So end of 2021. Um, there, I know there's been some talk conjecture that they might have data at ASCO, so maybe the middle middle of the year. But again, we'll we'll get sort of the first data from from Encarta uh, towards uh, you know I guess at least in the second half of the year. I'm going to bust through these. All right, third company here, uh, Gamita Cell. Uh, the reason I, I, I chose these guys is, um, is that they are doing right now is that they get their, um, they get their, uh, they get their cells from cord blood. So again, a different, a different source for their NK cells. And right now what they're doing, they're not doing any engineering. So they're doing um, just sort of a quote unquote, the naked NK cells with no sort of further engineering done to them. Um, and so the question, you know, one of the questions that rises is, is do you need to do all this engineering? Do you, you know, do you need to add the car? Do you need to add different things to the NK cells to make them effective for patients? Um, and it's one of the questions that, you know, we really don't know, we can't answer yet, but uh, can meet a cell by, by sort of looking at or taking approach of sort of not engineering their cells. Um, that, you know, again, the, this is my work, and, and we've, we've seen some early data, um, some data that was presented last year, again, in uh, showing they had they had some data. I think I think it was just under twenty, but nineteen patients um, that they treated with with this product with their first product. Uh, these are patients who had um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, all sort of heavily pretreated. They had uh, and they and they gave it in combination with rituximab, and they showed uh, a seventy-four percent response rate. Sixty-eight percent of those responses were were complete responses. Um, so, uh, you know, again. Uh, like like that like the MD Anderson study, you know, uh, early evidence of of disease activity for an NK cell therapy. Here's just a little bit of summary of of what their data looks like. I'm mindful of the time because I'm running out. <laughs> All right. That was done for NK cells. I hope that uh, I hope that helped kind of give you a little bit of an overview of uh, what's going on. Um, lastly, and I and I have a few. I just have a few minutes, so we'll we'll breeze through uh, mRNA uh, in cancer. Uh, there's not a lot of data to show, so it's actually easy to kind of breeze through this. But if you think about what we know right now, uh, obviously, I think mRNA is one of those things that a lot of people have heard about again because of of the COVID vaccines. Um, and if you think about the Moderna vaccine, if you think about the Pfizer vaccine, you know, how do those work, right? Uh, what we do is, what those companies do is they take strands of messenger RNA, which instruct the body, you know, to make the spike protein that's found on the surface of the coronavirus. Um, and then once that's introduced into the body, immune cells recognize that spike protein and they make antibodies against it and, and kill, kill the virus. And that's the basis for the COVID vaccines that are now, uh, Hopefully, we're all well, we're all getting, or a lot of us will be getting, uh, in the weeks ahead. Um, so the same, if you think about it, the sort of the same idea can be used in cancer. If you think about what can happen in cancer, is instead of instead of the spike protein of the coronavirus, what if you found a protein that is found on cancer cells, and you had the messenger RNA in the body once it, once it gets in the body, instruct the body to sort of make that have the immune system recognize that cancer protein, and then those immune cells would then attack uh, the cancer cells. So essentially, that's kind of what's going on, essentially, for a, a big part of mRNA and cancer, that's kind of what what companies are working on. So you've got you've got these personal, you know, what, what, you know, essentially are personalized cancer vaccines where uh, patients, a tumor is taken out of a patient, uh, you know, and then uh, what's done is it next gen, like next gen sequencing, you know, genetic sequencing is done to the tumor to identify very unique gen molecular genetic signatures of that tumor that are maybe unique to that patient. And then you can take, you can, you can, you can analyze, you can identify that sort of that unique molecular genetic signature of the patient's tumor. And then you can create, you can synthetically, basically what you do is you create, uh, you take RNA and you basically create, you, you create a, a sequence that, that you can then inject into a patient and have the, have the patient's immune system be able to recognize that aspect of the tumor and hopefully find it and kill it. Um, if you think about uh, personalized cancer vaccines, sort of the history of, the, of that field has not 
been very successful. There, there are very few. If you think about like Dendrion, the, the old Dendrion Provenge vaccine is kind of one of the only approved cancer vaccines out there. Um, this is a field that has not worked all that well, um, but there is hope that mRNA um, potentially could be the way that to make this burger. And so companies like Moderna, companies like BioNTech that are, you know, the companies that you know from the COVID vaccine world are all actually all working as well in cancer. Another area here is uh, looking at intratumoral therapies. These are, this are these would be potentially be mRNA, mRNA based therapies that you actually inject or inject inside the tumors. And and here what you're what you would be trying to do is you're looking at tumors that were that were sort of immunologically cold tumors, tumors that don't attract, that don't have activity for whatever reason. The tumor microenvironment is is cold or like it's basically resistant to uh, immune cells, um, and so immune cells don't find it, they don't attack it, and these are the kind of tumors that um, typically a, a PD one or PDL one don't work don't work well with. These are the type of cancers that where you really can't use a checkpoint inhibitor. You don't so you don't see a good response rate. Um, so the idea here is to use mRNA to use these uh, these intratumor therapies, inject them into uh, the tumors to sort of turn them turn a cold tumor hot and then use that in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor, hopefully to get a, a better response. Uh, again, Moderna, one of the companies being uh, that's working in the space. This is a study that is ongoing. I think an, a study that uh, keep your eye on uh, to look to see sort of the, you know, kind of proof of concept of whether or not uh, an adjuvant, again, I hear a personalized cancer vaccine in combination with pembrolizumab, Keytruda, in melanoma, whether or not that can, uh, you know, what kind of results that can show. That's something that you might want to look out for. And I am running out of time. So again, this is uh, this is uh, the area here. BioNTech, as I said, also working in this area. I mentioned, uh, you know, here I look at, I mentioned the individualized new antigen against specific immunothera immunotherapy that is a personalized cancer vaccine. They're also looking at actually sh what they call their fixed fact platform, which is shared tumor associated, associated antigens. So those are antigens that they've identified on certain types of tumor cancer cells that are shared by lots of patients. So that would be uh, like a, that would be more of a, you know, an off the shelf product that wouldn't be personalized. And again, they're also looking at intratumoral therapies. We don't know the answer to this question. All right, that I have run through my thing. I did it about an hour. That's amazing that I got it all in in an hour. Um, I am looking over your questions because I should have done this before. Give me a second. So someone asks, is there a common element that distinguishes cancers that respond to immunotherapy from those that don't? Um, it's a good question, you know, and it's one of the, you know, it's one of the sort of the fundamental areas of research is, you know, obviously what you want to do is ideally you want to be able to identify a patient before they go into therapy. Is there a biomarker? Is there something about a patient um, where you can, you could know whether or not they would be predisposed to uh, responding? To, a to immunotherapy or not. Um, and so right now there aren't, you know, it's a, it's a, I think it's a field in flux. I mean, right now, um, you know, you can look at, you can look at PDL, PDL1 expression, you can look at tumor mutation burden, which again is a, is a sign of the sort of the, the number of mutations in a cancer and what, what, what we've seen data to suggest that, that tumors that have higher mutations, higher numbers of mutations, a higher mutation burden are more apt to, uh, respond, to, to respond to immunotherapy. But at the same time, right now, you know, that's something that, you know, patients still to this day, you know, it's not, it's not an exact science and patients today, you know, it, it's why response rates to immunotherapies are low is because there are a lot of patients who get immunotherapies who just don't respond. Is there a reason to choose one source over another when a company decides where to get their NK cells from? That's a good question, Mike. Um, you know, right now, I don't think that there is, I think the jury is out on what the best source of NK cells is, um, if you talk to all of the companies, if you talk to Gamita, you talk to Encarta, you talk to Fate, they will all give you reasons why they feel like their 
source material, the way that they source NK cells is the, is the best way of doing it. But again, I think it's one of those questions where we'll just have to see um, if there's any differences and, and that will play out in, in the clinical data. Is there a comparison between anti tinge and anti pdl one and anti pdl one only? Um, so again, yes, I mean, so I mean, they are looking at, I mean, again, we are looking at the companies that are developing these are looking at these combinations where they're looking at combinations of a Tigit and a, and a PD-1, pdl one checkpoint inhibitor versus, uh, you know, just giving a patient a PD-1, pdl one inhibitor and that, and that ultimately will decide whether or not the combination is better. Was there any data reported for Teragula, to, Tiragolumab monotherapy. Um, I don't have the data off the top of my head. I think what I, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong. I think that, that, that there has been some data, but it basically showed very little response. So I think there's very little response when you look at a tinge drug on its own as a monotherapy. Um, and that's why, you know, again, that's kind of one of the red flags. And it's one of the concerns because we've seen that before where, you know, if a drug doesn't have single agent activity, um, why would it have combination? Why would it have activity in combination? Um, you know, the Roche data uh, suggests that it does because again, we're, we're looking at randomized controlled data from that study that I showed you. Uh, but again, that is one of the sort of outstanding, uh, you know, unanswered questions. What's the rationale for using Tigit from Roche in small cell lung cancer? Um, the rationale is simply the data that I showed you. Uh, you know, lung cancer is one of the more immunolo immunologically active cancer types. Um, as we, as certainly, as we know that you know, there's you know, it's become the standard of care for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the reasons why they've taken. Uh, Tigit and taking it into lung cancer because you know if you're going to see a response if you're going to see benefit for patients that's probably more likely one of the cancers where you would see that. Someone asked, "What's your opinion on NK cell engagers versus NK cell therapy?" Um, I was going to get into that and I didn't, um, but I may follow up. One of the things that I'll try to do, guys, is um, I will try to follow up with a mailbag, um, looking over the questions, and I'll try to answer some of these questions uh, in a in a column. Probably come out next week, um, and that's one of the questions, Juliana, who asked that question. I can uh, I can try to answer that for you. What about immunity bio and NanQuest? Are they in running? Are they a results uh, or are they results suspect? Um, Franz asked that question. Uh, yes, NanQuest, which uh, is a company that is working on NK cells. I didn't mention them here, but uh, yes, they are definitely a company that's involved developing NK cell therapies. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't mention them only because I couldn't, I, could, I, did, I had limited time. Someone asked me about Allergen. Um, again, Allergen, um, they asked me what about Allergen? Again, Allergen is a company that's developing uh, an off the shelf CAR T therapy. Um, I just didn't have time to talk about the, the you know, CAR T therapies, off the shelf CAR T therapies, but yes, uh, Allergen is developing several different um, CAR T, off the shelf CAR T therapies. And I think, you know, again, that's kind of, you know, ultimately, you know, that be a, could be a potential competitor to an NK cell therapy. I mean, I, we just have to see how the data plays out. All right, so with that, I think I am going to end this webinar. We've gone a little over an hour. Um, I appreciate everybody's time and patience. Uh, if I said anything uh, crazy or wrong, you certainly know how to reach me, so let me know. And like I said, I will try to answer some of the other questions that we got here through the Q&A um, in a mailbag column for next week. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Evan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to our webinar sponsor, BD Biosciences, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, Future Directions for Cancer Immunotherapy. You will receive a follow-up email from STAT in 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. In the meantime, you should see a survey link pop up on the screen post-webinar and in the follow-up email. We very much appreciate any feedback you have. On behalf of STAT, thank you again for joining us today. Please stay safe, be well, and enjoy the rest of your day.